and get going. So this week we are talking about data structures and collections. Data structures are just ways to group your data. That's all they are. Okay, there's lots of fancy terminologies. You can create all kinds of data structures that you want. But there are two basic kinds in Python. There is a list, which we've already talked about in strings and done a little teeny bit of work with. Lists are ordered, mutable, which means they can be changed, and they rely on an index value that's given to you. You cannot assign the index value. It always starts at zero and, and continues on from there. Then there's a dictionary. The dictionary is the brand new data structure this week. It is unordered. It does not have an index, and it's also mutable. Dictionaries rely on something called the key value pair. And so you've got data, but you're going to give that data, that data point a name. And that can be very handy, um, especially when you start dealing with large data structures. Um, there's actually an entire, well, if you've ever heard of no SQL databases, like MongoDB, they run on the, on the concept of a dictionary. Everything's a dictionary. So we have some new symbols. Well, the first symbol isn't new, but it is the symbol for a list. It's the open and close square brackets, and it tells Python that a list, um, to, that something about a list, either the whole list or an element in a list, is about to be read. Um, then there are curly braces, and the curly braces do kind of the same thing for dictionaries. And I say kind of, and it's a little bit confusing to students, but when you, you, when you create a dictionary, you use curly braces. When you access an element in a dictionary, you actually use the square braces and use the key, in the, um, key as the value inside the square braces. So it's not an, a one-for-one one swap, but creating a dictionary, you do it with curly braces, and that's how Python knows that you're expecting a dictionary and not a list. So we have a new keyword, kind of. It's del, which delete is meant, means delete. And you can delete a whole list or a whole dictionary. Or you can delete an element from a list or an element from a dictionary. And there are just a couple of very quick examples on the right-hand side to show that. So what's a list? Well, a list is a collection of data, an ordered collection of data. A, an open square bracket tells Python to expect a list. A closed square bracket tells Python the list is finished. So if I have an example my list, I have an open square bracket. I'm going to put Lisa, the string, 42 and 3.14 in that list. I'm going to separate all of the list element with commas. And then I'm going to close the list with the closed square bracket. Now you'll notice there is no comma after 3.14. You only need commas in between elements. So the open, the open, you don't have a comma after the open bracket. You don't have a comma before the closed bracket. It's only in between the elements. So, oh crud. We're going to do crud again. We're going to do crud twice tonight. You can create an instant, you can create a list, which means you instantiate it. You can get data from a list, so you can read it. You can update, and this is a true update. So you're going to modify a list, and it's going to change some element in that list. And you can delete, which means you can remove an existing list or remove an element from the list. So let's talk about lists and create. So there's two ways to create a list. There's a, a, an empty list, which is just the open and close square brackets. This is completely legal code, and you will use this a lot. And you will use it a lot because in your labs, oftentimes you're going to have, especially this week, you're going to have to create a, an empty list and then populate it for different reasons. 
A populated list simply means you've got elements within the list, 1 to n elements, however many you want. Um, and that's how you create a list. Those are the two ways to create a list. They're pretty straightforward. All right, we're going to get data out of a list. Now we've done this before. We know that there's a variable named my list, which is here up in your Python script, and that the list itself has these um, index numbers. It's like a hidden index. You don't assign them. Python assigns them, and they always begin at zero. So this is how you get at data in a list. We've done this a couple of times. And you use the index number. So if you want the first element in the list, you use index zero. I know it's kind of, it kind of is maddening. But um, if you want the second element in the list, you use index one, and so on. Update. I can change lists. And this is how you do it. I have a list with something in it. I'm going to, just as an example, I'm going to print my list of zero, which is going to print Lisa, because that's the first element in the list. Now I'm going to change Lisa to Bill by saying my list, open square bracket, zero, close square bracket, equals Bill. And then when I print my list of zero, it's going to print Bill. And what happened is in memory storage, I simply removed the word Lisa and replaced the word Bill. Um, I didn't have to replace the whole list. I didn't have to regenerate a list. I simply changed what was in that particular space in computer storage to the word Bill. That's it. That's all that you have to worry about. And, oh, shoot, I changed some of my variables. There we go. And let's move that over. Apologize for that. Okay, now that's right. So that's all you have to do is just whatever element you want, whatever index you want to change, you just use the, the name of the list with a square bracket, the index number, and another square bracket, just like you would a variable. You put it on the left-hand side of a single equal sign, and on the right-hand side of a single equal sign, you put the new value. And you've just changed the list. It is that straightforward. So you can use a list with an index value just like a variable. So I want to delete from the list. So I can remove an element from the list or I can remove the entire list. So here I've got my list again. Rud, I didn't get my variables right. There we go. What, what what you get when you copy and paste and don't always pay attention. I shouldn't say that since I'm supposed to be teaching this. Okay, let's do this again. So I have my list, and I want to delete an element in the list. I want to delete the word Lisa. What do I do? Well, what I do is I use the del keyword with my list and the index number to remove Lisa. And what this does is Python will automatically re-index your list. So Lisa's gone. So 42 is now at index 0. That's it. It just automatically moves everything over, re-indexes the entire list, and you start again. You still, you still have a zero, but zero is now different. OK, let's talk a little bit, just some list basics. This is challenge 6.1.1. Modify short names by deleting the first element and changing the last element. This is classic update. So 
here's how Zybex is going to deal with lists. It is going to use have user input, so you're going to get user input, and it's going to be a comma-separated list. So you have to use the split function with the comma delimiter, which is the line that just showed up here. And you have to use that, you're going to have to use that from now to the rest of the class, okay? They, uh, and, and you're even going to have to use it in a dictionary, <laughs> in a dictionary to create the dictionary from user input. And I'll explain that in a little bit. But remember, if they ask for user, if, if they tell you that you're going to accept a string, you know, separated by commas, it's telling you that you are using a comma delimited list and you're going to have to use the split function. So when I use the split function, on my input, I get a list, Gertrude, Sam, and Joseph. So I'm going to delete the first thing, which is what it says here, deleting the first element and changing the last element to Joe. So when I delete the first element, my list shrinks. It's now Sam, Ann, and Joseph. When I change Joseph, I change the last element to Joe. Now, you'll notice that I had to do it in this order. If I didn't do it in this order, my names of two would have had to have an index of three and not an index of two. So be careful of order because if you get things out of order, sometimes iBooks, sometimes the calculations might not be as you think. So that's the basis of a list. Now here are some list methods and we're going to go over them and we're going to look at some code. Um, and by the way, this is a very, 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 very short list of what you can do with a list. I put the link up there for Python 3's tutorial about data structures. If you're interested, it's a good, if you're interested learning about more about data structures from Python, it's a good page to learn about data structures. It tells you about all of the different functions that you can use on a list. Now, some of these functions um, you might just need for this week's um, labs. So, we have count. We learned about count, well, well, we did, yeah, we learned about count with a string. You can count with any list. And it's going to count the number of items with the value of x, whatever x is. Um, you can sort a list, so it's an alphabetical order. You can append an element to the end of the list. So if I have a list of three things and I need to add, a, add another element onto that list, I would append the element to the end of the list. And reverse is reverse alphabetical sort. So sort goes from A to Z, reverse goes from Z to A. Um, sort and reverse. Challenge 621, sort names in reverse alphabetical order. So I'm going to input a list, Jan, San, Sam, Ann, Joe, and Todd. Now you'll notice there are no commas. So this is space delimited. So when I split, I'm just going to say open and close parentheses because it assumes a space. So now I have a list with five elements. That list, if I'm going to do names.sort, is now going to put the names in the correct order. Then I'm going to reverse the sort and put the names in reverse alphabetical order. And that's it. Um, let's go and look at a little bit of code. Um, So, yeah, um, directions, that's the example we're going to go over later. Um, so, yeah, this pretty much is what we were just talking about. We have a list, and we're going to sort it, print the names, reverse sort, and print the names. This is, yeah, not that interesting. Oh, what's interesting is, here we go, this is the dot notation again. Remember 
when we have talked previously about using the dot notation. Okay, the dot notation is the name of the list dot sort or the name of the list dot reverse or the name of the list dot count. So this says Python. I want to sort the elements in the list alphabetically and the list I want to use is the list associated with the variable names. So that's what the dot notation does. It gives you the association of what you want to do. So remember that when you're doing the sort stuff. Um, and if I'm going too fast, let me know. I'm partly going fast over lists I'm going to slow down a little bit on dictionaries because I want to give us time to talk about the project. Lists and loops. Four lists are made, four loops are made for lists. List, uh, lists are finite. They are not infinite. They do not rely on the fact that somebody is saying, you know, left, right, up, down, or quit. Um, the in keyword provides the element from the list. It can also get you the index value from the list if you use it with the range function and len. These are just some uh, reminders from a, some stuff we did in the string and that we've kind of done through labs. But I wanted to make sure that it was explicit and remember all lists start at index zero. So if you're going to get the length and use that length to do a for loop over the list, you always have to remember that it's length minus one or else you're going to walk off the end of the list. And I'll show you what that uh, looks like. So here's challenge 63.3. And we're going to write a loop to print all elements in hourly temperature. Separate the elements with a, an arrow surrounded by spaces. So I'm going to input, and this is space delimited, 90, 92, 94, 95. So I'm going to create a list called hourly temp. That list is just going to have the data in it that the user input. So now I am going to um, Iterate over the list using a for loop. I said for index in range len underscore hourly temp. So in is the keyword it says OK range. Sorry. In is the keyword that tells Python to expect a range of numbers. So I'm going to print hourly temp of index. And I'm going to then end it with a space. I do not want to end it with a new line, which is the, um, sorry, it is the default ending is a new line. I don't want to do that right now. I want to end with a space. So now, because you'll notice before I said len hourly underscore temp, and I didn't say minus one. That's because a little later on here, I'm going to catch that issue. I say if the index is not equal to length of hourly temp minus one, then I'm going to print my arrow with an ending of zero. So for index of zero, I'm going to print 90 and I'm going to print an arrow. So for index of one, I'm going to print 92 and an arrow. For index of three, we'll do it again. I'm going to print 94 and an arrow. And for 95, I'm going to just print 95 and I'm going to end the loop. So that is what you do when um, you're going over a loop. It's just like when we went over a string. So let's go to 633, because I think there's something I want to show you. 633. OK. Um, yeah.
range zero len hourly temp. And this is, by the way, this is correct. I misspoke earlier. This is because range, the final, the, sorry, the end value of range is not inclusive of the number. You don't have to use a minus one with the range. My bad. Um, so let's just keep going. Okay. Here's something new. Multidimensional lists. Multidimensional lists are spreadsheets. If you've ever seen a spreadsheet, then you have seen a multidimensional list. Lists that we have worked with up until this point have been flat lists. There's just a single row of numbers. Multidimensional lists have multiple rows of numbers. So you, you have the concept of rows and columns. The way that you format when you're, when you're creating a multidimensional list, if you're, popula if you're creating one that's already populated, you have an open square bracket. You're then going to have another open square bracket. And that other open square bracket is going to represent the first list within the multidimensional list. So after that open square bracket, you're going to have values separated by commas, just like any other list. Then you will have a close inner square bracket when that first list is done. So far, so good. Now I'm going to put a comma after that. Why in the world am I going to put a comma after that? Well, because for the outer list, for the multidimensional list, that first list is a single element. And you have to get that first list to get to the elements within it. So the multidimensional list has a list as its first element. And that list that's the first element of the multidimensional list has elements itself. It can get really tricky if you try and have lots and lots and lots of, multi, of, of dimensions in your list. If you have to go beyond two or three, I would restructure your data. Um, so then I have the next row, which is 40, 50, and 60. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to open a square bracket. I'm going to add my numbers with commas in between them. And then I'm going to close my square bracket, and I'm going to follow that with a comma. I'm going to do that one more time because I have three rows in my multidimensional list. I'm going to open a square bracket. I'm going to add the number separated by commas. And I'm going to close the square bracket. And then I'm going to close the outer square bracket. That gives me a list of three lists. And it's a multidimensional list. Okie dokie. So this requires nested loops. And I think that this is, this, there's a lot going on here. So I think I am going to run this one in PyCharm 651. So here is, oh, wait a minute. Didn't want, okay, there we go. So here is 651. And 651, oh, wait a minute. Let me select this. My cloud. Uh, there it is, module six. Six five one. Okay. So I'm going to have a list. I'm going to have a user input with uh, um, numbers separated by commas. And what I want to do is I want to create a multidimensional list out of this, the, the user input that I'm going to get. And I'm going to have to do, and then I want to output it as a table. So I want to output it with specific format. So I've got two sets of multidimensional lists in here. I've got two for loops. I've got my outer for loop and my inner for loop. 
So let us debug this because we all know how much I like the debugger. And I'm going to go back here for a second and remind myself. One, two, three, four, six, three, six, nine. Okay. So that's how that's. I, I couldn't remember the format of the input. So here I have. I'm going to um, have some user input. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say one space two space three, comma. 4, 5, and 6, comma, 7, 8, and 9. And what this does is it gives me three lists. It gives me three elements in my list that are space delimited. So uh, on my console, I'm going to step over. And what I have in the debugger is from my user input, I now have three distinctive elements in my list called rows. And those elements are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Now, they're not separated by commas, so they're not anywhere near, they're not, they're strings. That's all they are right now, they're strings separated by commas. So how do I make this into a multidimensional list? Well, the way I do that is I use the fact that I can split each one of these based on space. Now, I have to have one loop for each dimension, and those loops have to be nested. That is how I am going to create from this string a, a multidimensional list. So that's why I say it can get very complicated if you go past two, because you will have to have more and more and more nested loops. Two is all you're going to need for this class. So I am now going to create an empty table, because i got to have some place to put it. So when you're doing a lab that is similar to this this week, make sure you create your um, your empty list, the, empty, the final product, out in the global space. So that's what I just did. I now have a table. Now I'm going to say for counter in range len rows. So rows has three. It's going to be 0, 1, and 2. So now I do this weird thing here. I say cells equal rows of counter dot split. Well, rows of counter, so the first element is going to be 1, 2, 3, and I want to split that using a space. So what that gives me is that gives me something called cells with 1, 2, and 3 in as a, as a list. So now I've just created a list from that first string that is an element in an outer list. So now, I, hey, I just, wait a minute, I just told you to create that empty list outside in the global scope, and now you have me create another list. That's correct. So I still have to have the place to put um, the, the cell values in the row. So I'm going to create something called rows, a row, and I'm going to say for cell counter in range len cells. And then what, what I'm really doing here is I'm converting them to integers because I'm, I have to convert them for integers based on the problem statement. And that's why I'm doing this. If I weren't having to convert them, I could just leave them as cells. But I can't just leave them as cells right now. Uh, I think that Zybooks just wants to force you to do the inner loop. So the way to do that is I'm going to walk through cells, and I'm going to change each of the values to an integer, and I'm going to append that to my row uh, uh, list. So as I step over that, I'm going to append the first element in the cells after I convert it to an integer. So if we look here at row, which is right here, and by the way, it is specifically in the inner in the, the local scope of the first loop. It has to be for this to work. And it has to be there because I have to populate it, but keep it going outside of that inner loop. And the only way to do that 
in in what with what we're doing is to put it in the local scope of the outer loop and leave it out of the inner loop. So row here is available for use in the inner scope of the inner for loop, but it is not controlled by that. When when this loop is done, rows will still be in existence. So I'm going to step over and do it for the second one and do it for the third one. So now I've got this row, but I really want stuff in table because I have to use this again outside of these two for loops. So what I do is I use table and I populate it with row. So I'm going to populate it with row. I'm going to go back up to the top. I am now, and but what you'll notice is that for the inner loop, you have to complete the inner loop before you go back to that outer loop. So now I'm back at the outer loop. I'm going to change my counter. My counter is now one. I'm going to step over that, and now I have four, five, and six. I'm going to reinitialize row because everything that was in row is now in table. So I don't need row to contain one, two, three anymore. I want it to be empty. So now I'm going to say four cell counter in range. Well, when I, as soon as I execute this line, cell counter is going to go back to zero because that's where it is in the new list that is cells. It hasn't executed anything over this particular set of cells. So I am going to just step over. I'm going to create my rows, which is going to be integers 4, 5, and 6. I'm going to now add that row to my table. And now I have my second row, my second list in my table, which is multidimensional. And I'm going to do this one more time for 7, 8, and 9. And we'll see everything reset as we went through it. Now I have a row that's 7, 8, and 9, and I have added it to my table. Now I want to print them in this format with bars in between them and spaces if it's not at the end of a particular row. So what I do here, again, is it's a multi-dimensional list. It's two-dimensional list specifically. So I'm going to have two for loops. I'm going to say for row in table. And then I'm going to say for index comma cell. And I'll show you what that does, um, what this enumerate function does, because it's very handy. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get, if I look down here at row, it's one, two, three. So I have gotten my row, which is one, two, three, and now I'm going to use this enumerate function. And what enumerate does is it gives me yeah, that whole multi-return thing we talked about last week. Well, this week, we get to use this function called enumerate. And what enumerate does is it's a multi-return. So it will return us the index and the value at the same time so you don't have to. It, it saves you from having to, you know, deal it write you the, sorry, you write a little less code. That's what it does. So it's a handy function to have. It is not dot notation, by the way. It takes an argument of whatever the table is that you've got or the collection is that you've got. So I'm going to say if index is not at the end of row, then I'm going to print a cell followed by a bar, and then followed by a space. So if I look at the console, that's what I've got. So I'm going to do this again. I'm not at the end of my row yet. So I'm going to now print 2. I'm not at the end. I am at the end of my row now. You'll see we didn't go in here. I'm just going to print the cell because I want that new line. So now I am done with my inner loop and I go to my outer loop and I'm going to do this two more times. So I'm going to walk through this. I now have um, a new row and I have four, five, and six. And the nice thing here is that 
uh, PyCharm tells you what you get back. And then I do it again. So 7, 8, and 9, and then I'm done. I go to my outer row. I'm done with that table. So this is how you work with a multidimensional list. You can think of this as a pattern, okay? You have some, some variable outside of your very first loop that's going to collect what you want it to collect. And in this case, we want it to collect a multidimensional list. Then you're going to have a for loop that goes over whatever it is you're turning into your multidimensional list. And then you're going to and then you're going to have a collection place. If you have to modify that data in any way on the input, then you want a place to collect it temporarily. And row is a temporary place to collect the data. And then you're going to go through the innermost loop and you're going to collect your data and modify your data however the program tells you to do it. When you are done with that, then you're going to modify the collection, the variable that you're using for collecting stuff that you defined outside of either for loop. So that's the pattern that you want to use when you're doing the multidimensional list stuff this week. And now I'll start going quicker again because I just talked a lot. Okay, let's talk about dictionaries. Dictionaries are an associative container. They have key value pairs, and you can have anything as a key or anything as a value. And the nice thing about that is for our project, we're going to want a room as a key, and we're going to want to have a dictionary as a value. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that in a bit. It is unordered, which means there's no index number. So dictionary syntax, we now have the right and left curly brackets. We are going to have members, and those are key value pairs. So I have a dictionary called my dict. It is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. I know it's a variable. On the right-hand side, I have an opening curly brace, and then I have quote name, quote colon, quote Lisa quote. What that is, is it is telling you that there is a key called name, and the value associated with that key called name is, is the word Lisa. And then I have a comma, and the comma, just like with lists, the comma in dictionary separates elements. And then I have, quote, age, quote, colon, 42. And so this says I have a key that is age, and the value associated with that key is 42, and the same with amount. So here's the key value pairs. Name is Lisa. Now, the nice thing about an associative array is you can, def you, using the key, you can actually provide meaning to the value. In the list, you can't. You just had Lisa 42 and 3.14. You didn't know what they were. In a dictionary, you can give that meaning, and that it can be very important. So we have CRUD with dictionaries just like we have CRUD with lists. You can create, read, update, and delete. So the way to create an empty list is open and close curly braces. That's it. There's nothing in between them. You just set that, uh, you assign that to a um, variable, and you have a collection place if you have to create a dictionary on the fly. You create a populated dictionary, as we've already seen. We have my dict, the variable name, equal, open curly brace, name, colon, Lisa, age, colon, 42, amount, colon, 3.14. And by the way, dictionary keys do not have to have, do not have to be strings. They can be other things. But for ease of understanding and ease of my examples, I've just left them as strings. Now we're going to read. So this is where things get a little weird when it comes to Python and dictionaries and lists. When you create a dictionary or create a list, there's that visual difference that you have a curly braces or square brackets. They kind of muddied the waters when they did 
the read from a dictionary because you don't have curly braces, you have square brackets. So I have my dict, which is name, Lisa, age 42, amount 3.14. And if I want to get the name out of that dictionary, I will use the variable my dict, open square bracket, the key, which in this case is the string name, close square bracket. And that is how I will get at the value Lisa. The same thing with age. Okay, age is just a key, so you put the key in between the square brackets to get at the value. It is equivalent to putting the index in for a list. But it's just visually it's a little weird because using curly braces to define a dictionary, but you're using square brackets to um, access a dictionary. Update. Update is, is the same thing. So we're using, for a list, we use an index value. For a um, dictionary, we use the key. So I have the name of Lisa in the dictionary first, then I change the name to Bill by saying my dict of name equal Bill, and it changes it in the memory space. Just like with a list, it just replaces it in the memory space. That's the same thing it does with a dictionary, it just replaces it in the uh, memory space. And delete, you use the del keyword. So we have del my dict, and del my dict of name. And so the first example is you delete the entire dictionary. The second example is you delete the key value pair based on the key. So everything is based on the key. All right, let's see. We're going to iterate over a dictionary, 6.16.1. So what they want to do is they want to create a country's population. And they want to do it by giving you a string. So the value of the string is C colon 136, I 142, US 318, and O 252. So the letter is the country, and the, um, the value is the population. So what am I going to do? Well, well, first of all, how in the world am I supposed to turn this into a dictionary? You're supposed to turn it into a dictionary by first turning it into a list and then creating the dictionary out of it. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to split on commas, and this could be very similar to a lab you might have this week. So you're going to split on commas, and now I have a list with these strings, and the strings have a specific format with the colon in the middle. So I'm going to define my holding place in the global space called country pop, and I'm going to create it as an empty dictionary. So now I'm going to, this is how you use a for loop over a dictionary. There, it's four pair in entries. If I use a four combined with the in, I will get the name value pair back. So, uh, I'm sorry, no, this is wrong. I have not had a dictionary yet. I'm at the, I'm at the list. I apologize. So it says four pair in entry. So pair is actually the string like C colon 136, I colon 124. So I'm going to split that and I'm going to get two, a, a list with two values. I'm going to get a list with C and 136. And so what am I going to do? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say country pop, open square bracket, split underscore pair of zero because that's the key equals split underscore pair of one because that's the value. So that's what I'm going to do for each of the elements in that list. And I will do that and, and append to, sorry, I will do that and it will create um, elements in my dictionary, key value pairs in my dictionary. Very simple. So I've got, I'm now a U.S. And 
I'm at O252. So now I've got my dictionary that I needed. But of course, I still have to do one more thing. So we're going to now have to print it out. So I want to, so this is where I meant to say you get both. So for country comma pop in country pop dot items. So here's the dot notation again. Items is a function that works on the dictionary. And what it does is it gets you the next key value pair. You get both. So on the left-hand side of the in, I have two variables, country and pop. Those will be local variables available in the inner scope of that for loop. And the first one will contain the key, and the second one will contain the value. And so now I can run through the dictionary and print country has pop people. Okay. So that's what it's going to do. It's just going to go out and print country has pop people. So now we're going to talk about that in relation to what we might have to do for the game. So you can have nested dictionaries. And that's what this is. And we're going to go out and see a little um, a little example of this so here are here's a nested dictionary so let's say I have three rooms in my house and I want to know how to get from one room to the other so and I can I can go north south north and south let's just say north and south I'm going to create a dictionary called rooms because that's what they are Dic the rooms dictionary is a variable just like any other variable on the right hand side I am creating a nested dictionary just like I could create a nested list I can create a dictionary of dictionaries I do this by simply adding another adding a dictionary putting a comma in adding a dictionary putting a comma in so if I look at the first entry the first dictionary in rooms I see that I have room one, that's my, my key, and my value is another dictionary. And that other dictionary has a value south, room two, north, room three. South is a direction I can go. And the value for south is that I can go to room two. And the value for north is that I can go to room three. Now if I go to the second line and I look at my second dictionary that is part of the rooms dictionary, I see room two. And room two is the key. To the right of the colon is north, is a dictionary with north colon room one. So from room two, if I choose to go north, I go to room one. And the final one is room three, same thing. After room three is the key, the value is a dictionary. The key of the inner dictionary for room three is south, and the value is room one. If I choose to go south, I'll end up in room one. You need an S dictionary for your game. So let's talk about move between rooms and then look at how I would move between rooms if I had three rooms and could only go north and south. So I have my rooms dictionary which we just saw and we just went over. The first thing I have to do is I have to have a starting place. So I'm calling that starting place current room. And the way I define my starting place is I ha I'm going to say rooms of and the name of the room that I'm starting in. So with your game, where are you starting your game? Are you starting it in the parlor? Are you starting it in the entry hall? Are you starting it in the dungeon? Wherever that is, that's going to be your current room. And then you need a direction. And this is where user input comes in. Now, by the way, 
this does not include the game play loop. I'll show you that in a second. But this particular example is a one-off. And it is, I, I did that on purpose. I only really on this slide want to talk to the use of the nested dictionary. So I'm going to ask the user to input a direction, north, south, north or south. The first thing I have to do is I have to check if that direction is valid for that room. Because if I put north in for room three, I'm not going anywhere. And if I try and get north, from the, the dictionary that is in room three, I'm going to get an exception. So first thing I want to do is I want to say if direction not in rooms dot keys. So I have to say is there is there a direction in the room keys for whatever room I am in? I'm sorry, this should be current room. I'll fix that. Um, otherwise. Current room now becomes, sorry, this is wrong. All right, and this becomes, I don't know why that was so wrong for so long. So what you want to do is you want to look at where you are. So you're always, you're always looking from the current room. So if the direction is not in the current room dot keys, then I'm going to say it's an invalid entry. Otherwise, I'm going to set my current room to the room for that direction, that directional key, and I will then be in a new room. And now it will tell me where I'm at. So if I look here, and let's assume that I somehow had made it to room three, and I put in north, I would print invalid entry. If I put in south, I would move to room one because I would have changed the value of current room from what it currently is to what it is based on the direction. Have I lost you guys yet? Well, I haven't seen any questions, so. Uh, so let's do this and then we'll go over the labs. Okay, where is it? Uh, iterate over a dictionary. I wonder if it's in module five. Input to list. What's that? Ah, here we go. So this is the script that talks to that. Um, and all I do here is I print your instructions and I say for room in rooms print I am in and then for direction in rooms. So this, this does it a little different, but let's just walk through it for a moment. And I say current room is room one, and my first direction is up. So these directions are up and down. The other ones were north and south. So if I uh, edit configuration, go to iterate, where is it? There we go. Sorry, we're going to go over a bit. And I debug. So I say for room in rooms, print I am in. So this is just to show you how that will how that will be. So I'm going to print I am in this room for direction in rooms room, and then I'm going to get the direction. So now it's up. And I move up to go to room two, and now down. And when I move down, I go to room three. So now I'm in room two, and I say for direction in room. So now I, when I move, I'm in room two. When I move down, I go to room one. I'm done with room two. I go. I'm in room three now because I changed it. And now I'm going to move up and I'm going to say when I move up I go to room one. So that's how you're iterating over the dictionary. And when I move down I go to room two. Um, yeah, current room equals room one, direction equals up, yeah. And then for the new room it's new rooms of current room direction. 
that's really the correct syntax. So I'm in room one, I move up, my new room is room two, and I print new room. I could also have said, and if I um, ask for user input, I would want to check it like I did on the slide. And I'm sorry, we are going over. Um, so let's go over the labs, and then we'll talk to see if you have any questions. So um, here, what we're doing is 6.2 varied amount of input data. So basically, I'm getting a couple of user tokens. And I'm going to convert the strings to integers. We did this in a previous example in one of the challenges. So I'm going to go through the tokens and I'm going to convert them. And by the way, this is a, this is a flat list. It's not a multi-dimensional list. And then I'm going to convert the token to an integer. I'm going to go over, do a for loop over the tokens. I'm going to convert it to an integer. I'm going to uh, append it to my input data empty list. So there's where I created my empty list. I'm then going to get the average and the max. Don't calculate your own averages and max. Python has very good functions. I think one is AVG and the other one is MAX. Use what Python has. Um, so I'm sorry. Yeah, I think Python has an AVG, but if not, just sum up the data and then divide it by the length of the data and you'll be just fine. But don't reinvent the wheel. I've seen students try and reinvent the wheel figuring out how to do max. And if you want to, that's fine, but you don't have to. Um, filter and sort. So here we're going to use those functions. So I'm going to get in information. This is, again, a flat list. I'm going to split on space. I'm going to create input data to an empty list. So this is my collection point that's in the global scope. Then for each token, I am basically going to say if the token is greater than zero, then I'm going to append it to my input data. Now I want to sort it. So I can sort um, my, uh, sorry, comment sort strings to integers. So I'm going to sort my input data. And I'm going to say values in input data. I'm going to make sure you're going to output it with a space. And then you do the output. So this is, again, another flat list. Word frequencies. One more flat list. Huh, I thought they gave you a multidimensional list. Anyway, so this is just how many times does a word um, uh, appear in a sentence. So I'm going to have user input, which is a, a single word, user sentence, which is the sentence. I'm going to say for index in user sentence. I'm going to output user sentence of index and the count of user sentence at index. So for each, I think it's for each word in the sentence. Um, yeah. The count of user sentence. I think it's the count of user input. My bad. There we go. And then the final one is you're replacing words. So you know you did that replacement for characters. We're going to do something similar with that for words. So here I have an empty dictionary. So I, I am going to be using a dictionary. And somebody's going to put in some words, and I'm going to split those words into a list. So here I'm going to uh, create word pairs in the dictionary. So for index in range 0, from zero to length of tokens, increment by two. So here I'm going to do every other set of elements in the list. And so zero and one become a name value pair. Uh, two and three become a name value pair. Four and five become a name value pair. So that's what I'm doing. And then I'm going to set word pairs of token at index equal token at index plus one. So I've just entered it into my word pairs dictionary. Um, I'm going to get input for a user sentence. 
And now I'm going to say for a ridge word, new word in word pairs. So I am using in to get, uh, sorry, word pairs dot items. So I'm using that dot items like I showed you in that one challenge. And then I'm going to <clears throat> set user sentence equal replace the original word with the new word in the user sentence, and that's just um, string modification. And then I'm going to output the user sentence. So that is 6.19. OK, questions. OK, going once. I had a couple of questions from early on. OK, that's cool. Um, could you go back to where you first started talking about dictionaries, that slide? Um, yes. Nested loops. Dictionaries, this guy. Uh, next one, maybe. Next one? I'll keep going. Yep, keep going. OK, tell me when. There we go. There you go. OK. Should that be my dick equals curly brace? Oh, yeah, it should. My goodness. That's what I get for being half asleep when I redo my slides. <laughs> Seriously. Nice grab, Brian. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Hold on. And then the other question I had was when we were doing the delete names from the list. Yeah. Yes. Let me when change. we after you deleted the first one, if we needed to change the last thing in the list, couldn't we use list negative one? Uh yes. As opposed to keeping track of the index numbers? Yes, you could use the shorthand. Okay. You can well, always was... use the shorthand. I don't always do shorthand because it's some students are are good with it, and some students aren't good with it. Okay. So I right. prefer to do it the longhand way, and then if somebody wants to do shorthand, do shorthand. Okay. It's completely good. Good catch on the curly braces, by the way. Well, thank you, thank you. And they're here, too. That's what I get, like I said, way late at night redoing my slides. There we go. Thank you. Um, anybody have any other questions or catch any of my errors? OK, going once, going twice. I will have the slides, the, um, the challenges, and the, and the um, scripts up in the morning. If you have any questions, please let me know. And um, I think in Module 5, you will find a um, script called Move, which I didn't go over last week. And it also talks to how to do the move between rooms. So um, everybody have a great weekend. If you're in my class, contact me if you get stuck on any of this stuff. I'll be happy to help. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to stop.